So I'm just really giving an overview um, of the AMR uh, problem um, and some of the strategies um, that are being used or could be used to address it. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, so there have been a number of um, sort of high profile reports aimed at policymakers as well as books aimed at the public that really sort of highlight the, the, the kind of extreme sort of nature of this problem. Um, and just some examples there. The middle one is it's probably been one of the most influential uh, reports, the O'Neill report from 20, 2016. Um, and it's not necessarily the most sort of scientifically rigorous, um, but, it, but it's, it sort of came up with estimates of the burden of AMR currently and projections of what the burden might be um, by 2050 if we don't do something about it. And, and even though they're sort of back of the envelope calculations and no one takes them too seriously, I think most people think they're broadly in the right ballpark. They're certainly plausible. And in fact, so, so that sort of comes up with an estimate now of about 700,000 deaths per year due to um, AMR. And this is certainly, I mean, sort of current thinking, the sort of smart money is that this is really quite on the low side. Um, probably, um, if we just consider bacterial infections, excluding TB, sort of the best guess is a more like double that per, uh, per year. So in sort, of, in, in sort of COVID units, we're looking at the equivalent of a sort of pandemic worth of deaths every five years or so. And that's currently, that's, um, that's if the situation doesn't get worse. So, um, so it's clearly a very serious problem. And the overwhelming burden of that problem, both now and projected into the future is in low and, and middle income countries. Um, so this is again, um, a graphic from the O'Neill report, just highlighting that Africa and Asia, well, they both currently are thought to, um, to, to experience the greatest burden and projected to experience the greatest burden as well. So, so what's causing this problem? What's causing resistance? So you sometimes read that the problem is caused by overuse of antibiotics, um, but I think it, it's fair to say the problem is just caused by use of antibiotics because the bacteria don't care whether um, the antibiotics are used appropriately or not. Um, so, so really here we're thinking about, I'm just thinking about bacterial pathogens and, and, and not so much about TB, uh, which is a kind of slightly sep um, separate issue, um, but about pathogens which are normally carried um, asymptomatically, but in a small proportion of cases can go on to develop infections. Um, so, um, so, so how do how does antibiotic use um, select for resistance in these? Well, it's kind of three sort of key pathways, I guess. There's one, there's within host processes um, shown in the, um, um, shown in the sort of top figure where someone takes antibiotics, they have a small proportion of resistant bugs, say in their gut flora. So these circles are my illustration of bacteria, the R, shows resistance bacteria and the antibiotics give those resistance bugs an advantage and they grow and sort of take over. And that means they can spread more easily between people and the, and the patient, the person will become colonized for longer. Um, antibiotics can also um, select for resistance with someone who's susceptible, who's not carrying resistant bugs, takes antibiotics that can increase their susceptibility to becoming infected by disruptions to their microbiome, to their host flora. Um, and there's also um, something that's talked about a lot is um, with contacts with um, infected, contaminated meat and animals, um, um, which are carrying resistant bacteria, they can also pass to humans um, as well. And of course, lots of antibiotics are used in an animal production um, and there's often very high levels of resistance there. So perhaps surprising thing is we don't, we're only recently really beginning to get a quantitative understanding of these processes, but there's still massive gaps in our knowledge about the relative um, importance um, of these sort of processes. And to sort of complicate matters even further, the resistance, the genes that cause the resistance uh, can jump around between um, kind of between species. 
between bacterial species. So resistance in one type of bacteria can spread um, to another, uh, very often on small pieces of mobile DNA called plasmids, shown here in the red circles. So we've known for a long time that this happens, but only really recently are we beginning to realize how, how often it happens. So, so in this paper here, we, I mean, it was found to be happening, this transfer of resistance between bacterial species in just about every colonized patient in the hospital. Um, so it's really um, ubiquitous and it makes control efforts um, much more difficult and understanding the epidemiology more difficult as well. <clears throat> so, so what can we do about the resistance and sort of what are the other drivers? So there was a nice review of sort of current thinking um, about AMR in Southeast Asia, but it's equally relevant, I think, elsewhere as well. Um, and there's a nice sort of graphic there that's, that's really sort of highlighted these conventional thinking on what are the sort of key uh, drivers of resistance. So there's no attempt to sort of quantify the relative importance of these. Um, and there's lots of uncertainties about them. And I think in some of them we don't, there's potentially even uncertainty about direction of effects. Um, so I think they have lack of knowledge is listed here. There's some studies have actually found more knowledge is um, correlated with more carriage of resistance as well. So it, it's, not, it's not necessarily clear that there's a simple um, solution in giving people more knowledge. Um, I think there may also be questions about treatments, non-adherence. Uh, non so, so most selection of resistance is what we call bystander selection. So the resistance is developing in bacteria that aren't being treated for the infection. Um, so actually non-adherence to treatment, if anything, might actually reduce selection for resistance in certain cases. So, so there's, I would say there's lots of uncertainty about these interventions. So in many cases, it's not that simply we know what the interventions are, and it's just a question of implementing them. Um, in many cases, we're really uncertain about how effective different interventions might be. Okay, let's next. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, let's go back. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing people often talk about is uh, rational and irrational antibiotic use. Um, and I'm slightly uncomfortable um, with this term. I mean, it sort of implies if only people could be more rational, we wouldn't have this problem. And I guess what people mean by rational use. Um, is something like this WHO definition that it's it's giving people the drugs that meet their clinical needs in the right dose for the right duration and also crucially I think at the lowest cost to them and their community and I think one of the issues with antibiotic use is that the interests of the patient and the community are not necessarily aligned so the next slide will explain what I mean um, so this is really about what economists call externalities. So if we contrast antibiotic use with vaccines, with vaccines, you get positive externalities. So if you get a vaccine, you protect yourself, but you also protect other people who don't get the vaccine because you're less likely to um, transmit to them. So it's a sort of win-win. So it's a bit of a no-brainer. So it's clearly rational at the individual and the sort of population level to encourage vaccine uptake. For antibiotic use, it's a bit more complicated. So the patient taking antibiotics might benefit from them, um, but then that antibiotic selects for resistance, they're gonna transmit more resistance um, to other people. So each time they use the antibiotic, it's kind of, there's more resistance in the community and the, and the effectiveness of the antibiotic is degraded somewhat. So in that case, there's a sort of negative externality. So, so, so the interests of the individual and the community are not necessarily aligned. So what's rational for one person to do might not necessarily be, be rational for the community to do. Um, so this makes things complicated. And, and this is kind of the problem that antibiotic stewardship programs are really trying to address and, and, and which is how, how you sort of trade off the benefits to the patient, but without selecting for more resistance um, in the population, and that's and that's a difficult problem, and I don't think we have the know all the solutions to that problem. 
So this slide, I guess, illustrates another issue about talking about rational, irrational antibiotic use. So often we have uncertainty about the, the effects of antibiotics. So if you sort of imagine a, a, um, a sort of antibiotic stewardship zealots traveling through sub-Saharan Africa and coming across a village where all young children were given antibiotics twice every year, whether they were ill or not. So if that person wasn't also a sort of zealous reader of the New England Journal of Medicine, they might think this is clearly irrational use. You're giving people antibiotics when they have no indication that they need them. And in fact, when you do the randomized trial, as they did here, um, this intervention giving um, azithromycin um, to children twice, year, twice yearly compared with a placebo prevented a, um, one in five deaths in children under five months years old. So in that case, it, it clearly looks like a sort of rational policy, but there's been lots of debate about whether what doing this policy, rolling it out, would, um, what impacts that would have on resistance. So, so these are real um, dilemmas. And I think as well as thinking about sort of overuse of antibiotics, it's also important to think of think about um, underuse, so lack of appropriate use. So, um, so and I think this uh, paper uh, preprint um, from Annie Brown, uh, this is from her uh, PhD thesis um, um, at Oxford, which are looking at um, antibiotic consumption globally and doing some sort of geospatial mapping. Um, and there's kind of, I guess, clear suggestion that there, there are major problems with um, with sort of under consumption of antibiotics. So, so with some areas not using antibiotics as much as they should be, or not using them in the right places, as well as overuse. Um, and clearly, the, the patterns have been changing over, over time, but sort of disparities um, have remained. Um, so, it's, so a major challenge is to ensure fair and equitable access to essential medicines. So this slide, I guess, is really an infomercial. Um, so this is just highlighting one other aspect of the problem that there are that sort of fake antibiotics are also a thing. Um, and that also sort of has an impact on uh, resistance as well. So this is really an advert for um, the sort of seminar three in this series on November the 4th, which if you haven't registered for, um, you, should. you should also, of course, register for the other seminars there. But there's a, there's a link to it there in case anyone interested. Okay, so, so, so what can actually be done about these things? So again, this graphic is from the O'Neill report. Um, and this highlights, I guess, potential interventions of varying degrees of evidence base, there's sort of public awareness. And again, I mentioned this, it's not clear that just making people aware of the problem is going to have a benefit. Um, in some cases, there's a good evidence base that sanitation and, and hygiene interventions can be effective, certainly in sort of hospital settings, sort of hand hygiene and so on, um, but also um, uh, kind of wastewater, um, sort of access, clean water. There's, there's often um, contamination in uh, water supplies. Um, there's, there's, there's questions about, inter um, about interventions um, for antibiotic use in agriculture um, and the environment as well. It's, um, it's a lot of interest in potential of vaccines to reduce AMR and also rapid diagnostics. And, uh, and all these areas are, are areas where, where, where the, uh, the Oxford Link Africa and Asia program are really involved in inter interdisciplinary research that's sort of combining randomized trials and modeling and economics, um, as well as sort of qualitative research as well. So I guess this sort of seminar is just really going to give us a sort of flavor of some of the work that's, go that's going on, but there's a lot more going on um, that's not going to be covered here. So what are the major challenges? Um, well, firstly, we don't have great data. There's limited variable quality AMR um, surveillance data and antibiotic um, use data. There's need to improve systems to collect such data and actually to improve methods to analyze the data that we have as well. I mean, there remains substantial uncertainty about the best ways to use antibiotics, whether that's looking at the duration of treatment um, and the choice of empirical antibiotics. We both have 
kind of major projects looking um, at these questions. Um, and um, but also we do have interventions that have been shown to be able to safely um, reduce a um, to a reduce resistance or unnecessary antibiotic use, um, both through sort of stewardship interventions, improved hospital hygiene, some cases vaccines, and some cases rapid diagnostic tests. So in these cases, um, we also need interdisciplinary research um, to promote adoption of such interventions that ties into what Sassi was talking about in the implementation research. So I think the inter interdisciplinary research has, has a role in, in, in sort of both these sort of challenges, but in fact, all three of these challenges. Um, and the third thing, thing is just the sort of economic aspects of it. And, and of course, economics is one social science that policymakers often take a lot of notice of, um, but often the economic incentives to adopt interventions to reduce AMR um, are kind of not properly aligned. Um, so there's a real need to understand these incentives, develop interventions that overcome these obstacles, but also there are, there's a need to improve health economic methodology to better quantify the benefit of reducing AMR. I've just highlighted um, this paper, which is really kind of a first attempt to improve methodology to actually put an economic cost on the benefit of interventions that reduced AMR. So if you don't have this, it's very hard to justify use of say rapid diagnostic tests from a cost effectiveness point of view. So brief summary then. So bacterial AMR, I mean, it's currently a leading cause of death globally. Um, certainly the highest burden is in lower middle income countries. We have major knowledge gaps concerning both the sort of underlying epidemiology. Um, and I think in many cases that there, there is substantial uncertainty about how we should best use available antibiotics to get the greatest health benefits. Um, and interdisciplinary research is needed both to sort of help address these knowledge gaps, to better understand how and why antibiotics are currently used, um, to better understand the impact, the impacts of AMR on human, as well as animal health, um, and to inform, I think, policy changes that might have an impact on, ac on, on access to antibiotics. And when we do have um, in, uh, sort of control measures that have a strong evidence base, um, there's, there's a need to develop and evaluate really scalable um, behavior change interventions um, to actually ensure they are used.